So, good morning, everybody. Um, 8.30 is terribly early for an IT conference, in, in my opinion. I'm really grateful that you all showed up. Um, there's two things maybe I can make up for this. One is to tell you that I'm, I'm based in Munich, Germany, and we have the Oktoberfest, a big beer party running right now. So, all my friends said, well, you want to speak at this conference, sure, we understand, but why are you leaving now? The other thing is I brought you a little thing, a docker whale, that I want to give away. And I do it right now to have it out of the way. Who's interested? It's a children toy. It's suitable for children that are big enough not to eat it. <laughs> well, um, my name is Frank Munz. Um, and honestly, I really, really like what I'm doing. Um, my work is kind of centered around the intersection of the classical Oracle Fusion middleware stack and the new things uh, that are often open source like Docker, Kubernetes, Kafka and things like this. And to be perfectly honest with you, it, it wasn't so easy to get into conferences sometimes and we always had to cheat our way in and, and talk about, like pretend to talk about the classical middleware stack like WebLogic and then like special things for WebLogic and then talking about open source additions. Now with this um, new conference that we have with the, with the code, Oracle code, this is different. Oracle is kind of reorientating and uh, focusing on this a lot, on coding, on talking to developers and on um, talking about open source projects that perfectly work together with Oracle technology. And this is a big trend that we are going to see. Um, maybe you know that this is the last event of this Oracle Code Tour and um, we all hope that there will be another one next year. Um, so I'm a member of this Oracle Developer Champions group, which is actually the group that is supporting this and uh, kind of people that they want to talk at these conferences. Um, so, I work with the classical Fusion middleware stack, I work with clouds. I wrote a cloud book in 2011 when nobody really cared about clouds. So that was early for market. I wrote one about WebLogic. WebLogic distinctive recipes also meaning like what WebLogic plus open source stuff. And um, yeah, I work with multiple cloud providers. I just got certified with Amazon. Now this presentation is actually about a journey, a journey from a Docker container that is trying to leave the little cozy world of my MacBook here where everything is localhost and everything is working usually. And it's uh, going to some real big distributed bare metal system that I brought you here. She's called Mini, it's a Raspberry Pi cluster. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more later. And from there, I think there's also a next logical step, maybe going to a cloud service. And what I'm trying to do is tell you about this journey. Um, show as many things live as possible and um, then yeah, finally see if you agree or not. I would kindly ask you to keep questions to the end. I won't run away, so I'll, I'll be around. And um, I try to show as many things hands-on as possible, but I think if you only see code, it, it might be a bit too much. So three things about Docker. And I'm not sure how, I assume you're all very technical, so I could say it's a uh, Namespaces, C groups, and a union file system, no? The namespaces, they bring us isolation, so we isolate one Docker container from the rest of, of the operating system. Um, the C groups, they, they limit a Docker container to the resources that, that it should access, and this union file system gives us this layered Docker image that everyone knows, like that, that you see when you, when you run a new Docker image and it's pulled from Docker Hub. So these are the technical things that are behind. For those of you not so technical, I want to mention like three important points, but I quickly go through them and then show you the thing live. The first thing we, we say we like about Docker is that it solves this work for me issue, that we sometimes have something in development and it's not working in production. And trust me, I had this many times. I was running middleware operations for BMW in Munich, like what seemed to be a, a, life, a whole life ago. And very often we had people telling, telling me that there is an issue with the production server because it's not working there and it always used to work in, in development. And I always said, look, we have like 2,999 other applications, they all work in production, yours does not. So guess what is more likely? But we always had this struggle and we always talked about like, what can we do to fix this issue? 
And if I ask you, what can you do to fix this issue, this issue, there's not an easy solution, no, because it could be related to many things that, I'm not sure if you can read it, it's anything like an operating system patch, the JDBC version. Uh, if it's about web logic, it could be the domain, the, the version, it could be some driver, some, some, some flag that you need to start it up. And how can we solve all this together? And the answer is, this is where Docker comes into play. So we say we Dockerize it, we, we put all those moving parts into an image and we create a container out of this image. We make sure it's running in development. And if the developer that usually says it used to work in development, if this developer says it's working, we take the same container and we test it. We run load tests. We run integration tests and finally we run it in production and we always tell people, well, go and develop those 12 factor applications um, and then you can scale them easily and we can scale them by a process or by container. And this is very often where the story ends. But this is actually the beginning of this talk because telling people, well, then just spin it up in production maybe several times to be able to cope with the load, that's not enough. And this is what we learned in the last two, three, well, two and a half years, I would say. So this talk is a bit more about how to get to production. And some of you might know that very often we say, well, then just do it on Kubernetes. No, that seems to be the default answer. And don't get me wrong, certainly I think the whole industry is kind of turning to Kubernetes. But you as an IT architect, you should also know the options and, and see what other possibilities you have. You should have a kind of toolbox and then pick the right tool. And it's even if Kubernetes is the best choice, you should know the others. And this talk is about knowing the other options. So it's not focusing that much on Kubernetes. Now I'll skip this. And that's the other thing that a lot of people don't get. When I heard about Docker, it was 2014. Bruno Borges was from Oracle. He was pushing the first Docker file to his personal GitHub repository. And I thought, that's great. I'm going to use this Docker file to create a WebLogic Docker image and to run it in the cloud. You know what? Docker, for the first time, is a, a, a format, a generic format, that allows us to run stuff in any kind of cloud for the first time in history. We never had this before. Before, you could kind of import something like your uh, virtual boxes to AWS. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But this this generic format that would run on any public cloud provider, we never had. And it started with Amazon, then the others came. And today we have one service that does it for Oracle. And another one was just announced um, yesterday. So Docker kind of avoids the cloud vendor lock-in. So if you're worried about this, if you have something in Docker container, you can run it in any cloud. So it kind of gets you from on-premises to the cloud and the same way it gets you from development to production. So it's like two different axes in my opinion. And the other thing that people like a lot is the ecosystem around Docker. So people say, well, the good thing about Docker is like, I was at a Cassandra meetup just the other week and uh, I saw how people demoed Cassandra, the distributed database. And, and I spoke to the guy and said, so what's the best way for me to try it on my Mac? And he said, well, just take a Docker image, you know, say Docker run Cassandra and it will run on your Mac. So like trying out things, having this ecosystem of, um, I think it's tens of thousands of Docker images that we can choose from. And I come back to this um, as well. Now, I promised you to do as many things hands-on as possible. So I want to switch to actually here. Let's see if this is working out. I think you can all read this and can even make this a little bit bigger. So I have Docker um, pre-installed. It's actually running on the Mac. There comes a special Docker installer for the Mac that brings a small, um, a small Linux kernel um, in, in a Mac hypervisor. So for simplicity, if you're not an expert in Docker, you should just assume it's a Linux system running. It makes life much easier. And then I talked about those Docker images. And if you say Docker images, you see all these Docker images that I already downloaded. And it's like a thing. Oh, it's wrapping here, it's not showing up too nicely. And if I say Docker PS, I see the running um, Docker containers and you see um, there's no Docker container running. What I could do is I, I could quickly start, do something in a Docker container. I could say Docker run and run something, let's say in a Ubuntu, um, Ubuntu container and let's just do a simple host name. So let's 
start a Ubuntu container and let's see what the host name of this container is. And you see it looks like this. It's a weird, unique number. And if I do a Docker um, PS minus L, the last running container, you see the same number, this container ID is the host name. So the container gets an ID and the same number is also the host name of this container. Now, um, let me try something else. Let me um, say Docker and not use Ubuntu, but maybe CentOS this time. And let's say, how does it work with this host name? What's in etc host? So now I'm starting a CentOS container. It has a different unique number, obviously, uh, because it's a different container. And the way it works that this becomes the host name, it's in etc host. Now, just as a remark, you don't really see the time it takes for the container to start up. It starts, it does something, and it disappears very quickly, no? Um, you say, well, that's very quick, no? Is this the whole purpose of Docker? No, we can do more. I mean, if you want, I can also give you a, let's say, a Oracle Linux. And I say Oracle Linux, and we run a bash. And the T is for terminal, the I is for interactive. And now I get a new prompt. Now I'm in a Docker container that is running a bash and I can say ls, or I could say again, cat, etc, host name, and so on. So this is like what people always say, ah, oh, that's just small Linux tricks, no? But this is the beginning, no? This is how we start. Um, I could say top and you see what's running in this container. There's not much running, no? There's actually top running and bash running. And I'm not sure if I should mention it now, but the hardest thing for me to understand is it seems to be that I'm in this container now. No, I'm, I'm working inside this container and I'm kind of protected. I have a very uh, small number of processes. I have my own system resources. But the reality is that I'm just running a, a bash process in the same namespace as the container. So there's no real container. It's just a namespace thing that kind of limits my view that I'm currently seeing. If this is confusing, just ignore it. But it took me a long time to understand that this whole concept of container goes back to namespaces and all what I see now is kind of the same namespace. So let's quit this and let's go for something like, you know, everyone is talking about blowing up our monoliths into microservices. So we will have a lot of microservices and Docker very often is sold as the thing to solve this microservice. Um, problem. So let me start a microservice for you, like docker run, and it's actually running in the background, d for daemon. It needs a port mapping because internally it's um, listening to 4 times 9, and I need to map this on my host. And just choose the same number, and the name of the container I put here, it's in my repository, fmuns, and um, the name is micro. If I do this, I get the long ID again. And um, actually, I can now play with this container and access it. Let me open a new tab here. So if I go for localhost and 9999, you see what it's doing. It's actually a very small service. It's outputting some text. And you see I've been using this in, in many other conferences. It's actually the first uh, Docker image, Docker container that I did myself. So I keep using it. Um, it highly depends on the network. Sometimes it's causing me trouble. You see it's counting, so you, there's some state in the container, um, but apart from that, it's not too exciting. If you think, why is it counting from one to three to five, no? Is that German engineering? Uh, it's more a side effect, no? And um, the other question is, the container is running, so how can I know what's happening in the container? And the answer is, well, first of all, I need to find out what is the container that is running. So PS minus L gives me the ID. And actually this um, container, this ID is also, um, there is also a logical name. So Docker creates a logical name for every container that you create. And it happens to be a adjective and the name of a computer scientist. So I could say um, Docker logs, give me the log files um, from this D3 container. And this is the log file from the output from the container. And now you also see why it's counting from one to three to five, because basically it's counting the requests, but my browser, he wants to get this, you know, this little faf icon that is displayed here. And this is the second request that is done by the browser. This is why it goes from five to seven, usually. Okay, so 
Mm. Are you impressed? It's getting better. Um, let's talk about scalability, no? Um, uh, let's talk about scalability a little bit later. Let me try and show you something else. Let's run another container um, that is not handmade, that is um, actually Nginx, Nginx, and that also needs support mapping because it's listening internally um, to 80 and I would like to map it to 8888. Oh, I think it should run in the background. It's, it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. Um, so if I go for 8888, you see it's the output of, of Nginx, so which is just running in this container. Now, um, there's one thing about those Docker containers um, that they don't have state. We want to treat them as immutable, so we don't really change the content. And that's a big difference to, let's say, a virtual box image where you start something and then you, you, you save it, you stop it, and you continue to work from there. The content of this web server typically is outside of the web server. So it's a file that is outside of the web server that is mapped into the container, into the running uh, image of the container. And um, I actually have an example for you as well. Let's just stop this here. Let's go to... Um, what I need is the path to, um, to map it. And I have it here in this file. And this is the, the, the command to start it. It's actually mapping a file that is locally on my Mac, on, on this Ocean Beach directory. And the second one is the um, location of this um, Nginx directory where it ex accepts, uh, uh, expects the, the file. And um, it's mapping it to 888. Let's see if this is working. So we go for um, Nginx start. And I should try and you see it's displaying a file that I have on a local directory on my Mac. It's actually a beach in Australia. It's called Denmark. It's not Denmark, the, the country, but it's a beach. It's a small example of how to access a file outside um, of the container. And the very last example I want to show you, and then we, we switch on to, to Mini, to, to the cluster. Um, actually, two things I want to show you. One is, um, I was doing a presentation in Norway a while ago and I said, we're going to dockerize everything in this, in, in this presentation. We even dockerized the PowerPoint slides. Um, so what I was doing is, uh, let's see if it's still working. So it's docker run. Um, I think it should run in the background. This is why the minus D. Again, it's listening, I think it's listening to 80 and I need to map this to something that is not used yet. So this is why I use seven times four and the name of the container is on my uh, repository and it's, um, I think it's slides O-U-G-N 17. Let's see if this is working. Uh, no. Oh yeah, this is the, the minus P is missing for the port mapping. Slides so OUGN17. You see it's starting up because now I get this ID and I should use the 777 to connect to it. So let's try this. Let's go for 777. And you see these were the slides I was presenting in Norway. And I wanted to show you one, just one, which is like, you see some are similar. Uh, I think it's gone. No, I don't want to show you. Now it's here. This is uh, one message I wanted to give that Google is, for example, using container technology very, very intensively. They start up 2 billion containers per week. Everything you do with Google, every search, every Google document, every Gmail is running in a container. It's honestly not a Docker container because Google was using this technology like C groups, namespaces, and the union file system much earlier. Google pushed actually this kind of technology into the Linux kernel. So they are responsible in a, in a positive sense for that we have this technology, which is actually also a good answer for many people that say, isn't Docker that new that it might be a security risk? And I think one of the answers is, well, not really, because if you put it in a slightly negative way, it's more like a very comfortable wrapper plus an ecosystem around this Linux kernel technology. 
that we have for around 10 years now. And Google is using this intensively and other companies um, do as well. Right. Now, last example I want to show you, and this is more about the scaling, so I'll, I'll kill all the others that I started. Um, remember when I was running the, the microservice, this one. I want to run more of these. So what I want to do is I want to have a small loop. I loop around x, and I think this x should go from 1 to, to 5 maybe, to start 5 containers. And I always forget the syntax. Maybe you need to help me. Oops. No, no. I think it goes here, no, the do. Does it? Does it? Yeah? OK. So this should, in theory, start five containers. It's still wrong because I could not map five containers to localhost 9999. So I need to have a, a more flexible port mapping. And this is what I get with a capital P, which says, well, map it to an arbitrary port on the host. Now, five containers is probably more than five virtual boxes that you could run on your laptop. Is, it, is anybody running more than five virtual box instances at the same time on his laptop? I almost bet that you don't. But I told you I'm based in Munich and I flew all the way here, so I think five is not too cool. How about 15 or 50? Well, how about 100? I mean, even if you don't like the presentation, you could say the German guy was running 100 Docker containers on his laptop. Oh, no, now we have this. Where does it go? It's wrong. No, it needs to. Yay, yay. Oh, thank you. Ah, this is what we want. Look at this. Every single line is a container that is started already. Now imagine how many virtual box instances could you run on your system and every single line is a running container. If I get a new terminal and I do a docker ps, you see they're running. You also see the port mapping that is happening here. And if I do this and I just count the lines, no? It says 50, 52, 54. Um, if you think about this like 21, 22, 23, it's probably starting every 200 milliseconds uh, to 300 milliseconds a container. And it will run 100 containers on, on my little MacBook. And that's the, the cool thing. The Docker technology is working locally on a small laptop, and it's also working for companies that start 2 billion containers like Google. So it's a technology that is suitable for one single host and a technology that works on a hyperscale. Right. Mm. One thing I didn't tell you is if I run an image like Docker run fmunds micro, the semantics behind is that it tries to run the image locally. If I don't have this image locally, it tries to pull it automatically um, from, from Docker Hub. So you could run my microservice example, like this one with the loop or without the loop, on your um, Linux laptop if you have Docker installed. And the cool thing is you need nothing. You don't need to worry about setting a class path, getting the right Java version. It's actually not even Java. It's uh, using Python. Setting any environment variable, adding any library, Remember when I told you it tries to solve this work for me issue? This is exactly the case. So all you do is docker run the image and it's running. Isn't that great? Who thinks it's great? Good. Okay, I tell you what, it's early and it was a trick question. But it brings me back to, to the few PowerPoints that I want to show you. This is what I was just trying to sell you as, takes a while. This is basically what I said. You can do this on your laptop and you will run my microservice. You don't even know if it's working with Java or if it's working with Python. It's just running and you see the conference is where I've been. You can do the stupid counting from 135 and it's great. And half of you said, well, it's great, no? But how about security? What we do here is actually exactly the same thing as if I give you late at night a box with a network cable and I said, Bring this box back to your office and connect it to your company network. 
Would you do that? Come on, it's just your company network and you know I'm a Docker guy, it's probably a Docker container. The idea is that those containers contain, so you shouldn't get out of the container. Remember I had to do this complicated mapping for Nginx to access a file outside. So what could go wrong? Would something escape this container, this, this box metaphorically? The answer is, well, maybe not, but once it's connected to the network, it could do anything, no? It could kind of run a distributed denial of service attack against the White House or against Angela Merkel and then probably some very unhappy big guys in dark clothes come and, and talk to you, no? So there is a risk and um, this is what I'm trying to tell people, just don't go and, and take any Docker container and run it. And this is what a lot of people do, actually, and this is not a good idea. People want Tomcat and they look in Docker Hub for any Tomcat. They want Nginx and they look for any Nginx and um, this is what you should not do. You should either only take Docker images from a trusted resource and there are some marked as trusted resource like Nginx, like, uh, uh, like Oracle and, and like other companies like uh, Cassandra stuff. Um, or you should check if the Docker container was built in a reasonable way. You can build them automatically based on a GitHub repository and then you can follow the steps and, and can decide yourself um, if you trust it or not. Okay, so um, you've seen the scalability. We've seen a little bit of debugging with the log that was not too exciting. And you see many different use cases for containers from microservices to showing people your slides to doing small Linux things. Um, there are many Docker images now officially supported by Oracle, so you can get WebLogic, um, you can get the database. Um, for the database, again, you can imagine the database needs to have persistent data, so you have to map it to an outside data file. The question is, does it make sense to run your database in a Docker container? And the answer is, uh, remember my first slide when I said it's great for testing, maybe this is when it makes most sense. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about what Oracle is offering. The only thing I want to mention is that for a long time people said, oh, that's great how you run your microservices with Docker run fmuns micro. This is exactly the way I want to run um, WebLogic now because I'm kind of sick of installing WebLogic or the Oracle database all the time. So what I do is kind of Docker run WebLogic and it works. It's just pulling it from the repository. And for a long time we had to tell people, no, unfortunately not, you know, because of lawyers, because of licenses. So it was never on the public, on the, on the Docker Hub. And it is now. So now if you sign up there once, if you say I accept the rules and you understand you only use it for development, you get your Oracle Docker images from the Docker Hub. And a lot of people don't know this. So this is why I want to mention it. Now I want to go actually a few steps further and I want to talk about something that I realized many times that things are always easy if people do demos including me on one laptop where you always put local host and we run our small hello world demos. The thing is what if, if you want to go to real hardware and this is real hardware, this is mini. I, I built her, it's a Raspberry Pi cluster and for those of you sitting uh, in the back, she looks like this. Um, for boards. Um, it's an ARM chip on it. It uh, comes with actually with a USB. It, it's using USB for power. So basically the box, the black box on, uh, on the bottom is, is powering the whole thing. It's, it's like a mobile phone charger with uh, five USB outputs. I need four for the Raspberry Pi and I need actually one for this thing that is already <laughs> down there. Um, that's the backplane. Um, that's a magic device that you don't see any network cables come uh, connecting those four blades. They're invisible. It's advanced technology. Invisible. I bought it at Amazon. They, it constructs an invisible backplane and it says Wi-Fi on the box. Now, ser seriously, I didn't want to have too many cables. I was experimenting with a Ethernet router and I wanted to use it for DNS and it, it had some bugs and then at the end I used this a colleague of mine built a similar thing so I thought this would work and um, it's working actually quite nice. So um, the other thing is it's running Hypriot Linux that you can download. It's a special Linux for the ARM chip. So the ARM chip is like what you have in your Android phone. Um, but apart from that it's not really, it's just four individual nodes. No? And um, this is where I want to show you what you can do um, 
either we can go for Kubernetes now. This is what I was initially planning to do and playing with it a little bit. Um, or we can see what, what other options we have. This is the building list that I did. So if you want to rebuild the same thing, it will basically cost you like $35 for one of those um, boards and then um, the Wi-Fi switch, a few cables, the charger. At the end, I think it's like two to $300 um, these days. Um, I wanted to gain hands-on experience. I never did a Raspberry Pi project before. And I honestly wanted to learn about Kubernetes and possibly about Docker Swarm. I was playing with Docker Swarm when it came out initially. And I was, um, I was super disappointed. It did all kinds of weird things. And I thought like, oh my God, if people really try and run their production load on this, this will never ever work. Um, so I was really suspicious. And I thought I'm going to go the Kubernetes way. And what I really wanted to see is running services on top of this and seeing um, failover and, and, and updates. Um, so let's just skip this. This is a typical interaction that happens in Kubernetes. And this is um, what I kind of digged out when I had the first problem with my Raspberry Pi cluster. And something didn't work. And actually, it's, if you count the, the, the interactions, it goes like 16. And I think my problem was at 14. Now, if you go and analyze this problem, what do you have? Well, you do a Docker PS and you see all your running containers because all those bits and pieces, they run in Docker containers. And it looks like this. And um, it's not as easy as, 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 we used to, as, as we used to have for normal, if you do normal, run normal servers where you kind of uh, um, recursively try and find your log files and grab for something. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but what I'm trying to say is that if you really want to run a Kubernetes cluster, make sure you're able to do it. So I had many requests where people told me, we want to go to Kubernetes in two weeks. We need somebody to set it up for us. And I think this is not enough because if you really run all your applications as microservices and on top of Kubernetes, it becomes like your new operating system and you really need to know how to deal with it. You wouldn't say we switch from Microsoft Windows to Linux and we need somebody that comes for a week and tells us how to do it. That's not really enterprise scale um, operations. This is how it looks in Docker Swarm. So actually much easier. Now I want to show you a little bit uh, what we can do with Mini. And what I have is like four open terminal windows. And what I'm doing now is I'm trying to switch the Wi-Fi to this one. And it's actually called Kubernet. Comes from Kubernetes. And now I should be connected. And those boards, they are um, in my ETC host. Um, so it's mini, zero, mini, one, uh, mini, two, mini, three. I could say ping mini one here. And you see it's, uh, it's pinging this, uh, this board. Um, the other thing I could do is if I need to access all those um, different boards, I could do something like access all of them together with a cluster shell. I think people that do server administration, they know this. There is something, this small script, it says hi mini. And what it does is it executes the host name command on mini zero to mini three. So if I run this, it takes a while, it's uh, kind of, sending the hostname command to all the different blades of, of mini zero to three and um, then sooner or later we should get an output and you see it's three one two zero do you see the order welcome to distributed systems this is what we have if we change from localhost where everything is working all the time to real well linux cluster it's not really a cluster because so far it's not working together and this working together is actually what I want to show you. Um, what I want to do is um, start a, a Docker Swarm cluster and try and start a service on this and um, try and scale it. So what I'm doing is, um, let me just check something. What I'm doing is just clearing up the screen, clear Docker Swarm init. This is how I start. No, oops. Ah, no. Of course, not here, not on my Mac. This is the local Mac first. What I need to do is I need to connect to Mini Zero here, and I need to connect to, let's go for Mini One here, 
The M1, M2 is like a short version of SSH into Mini 2 and SSH into Mini 3. And now I'm really connected to, uh, to Mini 0 here. So if I do a top here, this is running on, on the first blade and the second one on the second blade and so on. Um, and this is all mini file system and uh, mini networking and so on. The networking is isolated. The, my MacBook is together in a Wi-Fi with a mini cluster, but it's not connected to the outside by purpose because I didn't want to have too many things that are interfering. Now, what I wanted to do is say Docker Swarm init. And if I do this, it takes a while and it says it's initialized a, a swarm and I have a current node, which is this one. And this node is also manager. Now the idea is that the first node here, mini zero is a manager. And with this command, I can add more nodes. So what I'm doing here is, oops. Yeah, I run this here. I run the same command here. And as you see, it's using a token for security. Um, and it says this node joined as a worker, this node joined as a worker, and this node also joined as a worker. So if I do a Docker node ls, it's listing four nodes. One is the leader, it's mini zero. It got this little asterisk and all the others are listed as well. So it's working together. It's actually already building a uh, a small software defined network and connected those nodes in a secure way. And that's all the thing that makes those individual blades work together as one, no? And what I want to do is I want to have a second leader that is not active, but I want to say docker promote mini three. Yeah. Docker promote, I think it's docker swarm. Docker node promote. Okay, you see it's promoted as a manager. If I do a Docker, Docker node ls, you see there is a second one. It's mini three and it's marked as ready, but it's not active. Okay, now what I'm trying to do is try and start a service on this. Well, but first of all, I want to have something else. I want to have a visualizer here and the visualizer is also running in a Docker container and the script for the visualizer, it's called start vis. And the thing here is the visualizer is running in a Docker container, but the visualizer should visualize the Docker containers. So I have kind of the same problems I had with the web server. I'm inside a Docker container, but I need to see the outside, the other Docker containers and um, get the meta information from those Docker containers. So how can I get outside from one container to the outside and, and see the other Docker containers? And the principle is actually the same. And the trick is that um, Docker is using um, unique sockets to communicate and these unique sockets, they are actually a file at the end. Um, so what I can do is I can map this unique socket to the inside of the Docker container. So from the inside of the visualizer, I can see the outside. And let me try and start this. It's called start this and it's starting up and it's running as a visualizer and it's running on port 5000. So what I'm doing is starting 5000 here. Ah, and you see, Localhost is wrong, so I need to go to Mini 3 now and go to port 5000. And you see it's an empty Docker cluster. And this is what we need to change. We need to, hang on. We need to start a service. We need to say 
Docker service um, create and then it's minus minus name. Oops, thank you. Create minus minus name. And I want to call it micro. Micro. And actually it also needs a port mapping. It's 8888 to 8888. And the thing is called fmunz. And it's called RPI for Raspberry Pi dash micro. Micro. And actually it's version 1. So let's see if this is working. Takes a little bit, which is which is not a bad sign. <laughs> Docker service, great. Um, there's an error message, um, but I'm a professional. I can handle this. Actually, the good thing about error messages, the most important uh, thing is read it. And what it says, it it tries to connect to the outside to check if this fmuns uh, micro image is the newest one, but it cannot because there's no connection. But it is there locally, and it's actually running already. So if I do a Docker service ls I should see it and if we go to the visualizer uh, where is it come on it's here it's got a strange color <laughs> maybe this changes okay we'll find out now the other thing that I wanted to show you is to use this and say docker service um, scale and we want to scale this microservice to, let's say, 12 instances. So it's doing something. If I go back to my visualizer, uh, let's see if it's showing up here. It's refreshing automatically. Um, it's not really happy. It should be green, honestly, but um, let's just ignore this because we're running a bit out of time. Now, if I had more time, what I could show you is, um, to upgrade this running version of the service, which is version 1. So if I zoom in, this says tag 1. I have the same service that is version 2. And I could upgrade this, a rolling upgrade. So it would kind of stop one service, upgrade it, and run another one. Um, the other thing that we can try is we can just try and access it. We can say, let's go to, um, let's go to mini 3 and go to port number. 8888 eight, eight, eight. and probably this is not working this is why it's pink right now um, but this would be the way to access the service uh, it does work so this is the only thing the service does so I'm not sure why the visualizer is showing it in pink so it, retur it returns its own host name and it returns the version number so I'm super happy this is uh, this is working this is what it's supposed to do one cool thing I wanted to show you uh, not to show you it's too late now um, to show it, but um, if you only run one service that might be running, let's say, on Mini 2, you assume you should go to Mini 2 8888 and access the service, but you don't have to. What Docker Swarm does, it creates a routing mesh, and you can go to any, any member of the Swarm cluster, and it will automatically route you there. If I have like 12 services, um, it would also redirect me and it would do load balancing. So all this is built in. Yesterday at night I was talking to a colleague about this. He was trying to do the same thing with Docker Swarm and it's not so easy. It's a lot of manual coding. So because you all got up so early, I'm going to do something that we should never do. I'm going to do and pull a cable. That's the plan. Where's the visualizer? It's here. And I'm going to pull a cable from Mini 1 or Mini 2. I don't want to have the leaders uh, fail over, um, but I want to see um, what happens with my services. So I'm going to pull this one. It's really not nice for a Unix system to disconnect the power, but it's done. And <laughs> look at this. The visualizer takes a little bit of time to refresh. It should understand that One is gone. Ah, you see. Are you excited? This is as good as it gets. <laughs> and they're rebalancing. You, show they sh they, you see they show up on the other nodes. So this is the high availability. Um, I didn't show you the load balancing, but I explained to you the, the routing mesh that is behind. So even if there's one service, you always get to the right service. 
if you have more than one service, uh, it's uh, doing automatic um, load balancing. So this is pretty good. This is actually what most people do with Kubernetes, but it's much easier. It's built into Docker. Um, still, we're going to see a lot of Kubernetes solutions, but as I told you, just be sure you're able to manage it. You have somebody that you can call if it goes wrong. I'm not sure how many people you have in your address book. I, I, I had one guy I would be able to call if something really severely goes wrong. Now, the last part of the story that I wasn't really able to tell you because we spent a lot of time with our Mini is, now, probably you don't want to build your, uh, your Raspberry Pi cluster. No, that's not how you run your production load. And the answer is, uh, what can you do in production? And uh, one thing is that Oracle is offering a container cloud service that is surprisingly not built on Swarm and not built on Kubernetes. And when I saw this the first time, I thought like, oh my God, why didn't they take the standard? This is what we all expect. We want to see standards. Then I was playing um, with the service, which is actually right here. I'm not going to show you details now. Um, and I found it very, very easy. So it abstracts all the complexity from, you know, service, crate, blah, blah, blah. And it gives you a nice GUI. Uh, it's not standards based. And they say, this is the selling point. Um, it's just, uh, it's expiring. It's just easier without not being standard based. If you go to Microsoft Azure, you can choose between Kubernetes and Swarm, what you want to use for container management, but you also get the complexity of Kubernetes and Swarm minus the setup, of course, because it's a, it's a past service. So that's something you should have a look into, in my opinion, OCCS. It was just renamed, so nobody really can remember the new name. And a new announcement that they made yesterday is that there will be a similar service based on standard, based on Kubernetes, um, which was just announced yesterday. So this is the end of the presentation. Again, thank you very much for getting up so early, for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. It was worth your time. Thank you. Any questions, I'll be around. Please vote when you go out to have more uh, conferences and presentations like this. Thanks.